I want to give thanks to my counterpart in Davis County, David Cook. He gave me permission to utilize some of the materials that he had put together in, uh, for my use in putting this presentation together for you folks today. So I appreciate David's uh, allowance of that. Now, we'll, you'll see examples of brand names. I'm not promoting one and, and putting down another product. Okay, so there, there's no uh, no brands being promoted, none are being discriminated against. Right. Just strictly for the for the case of example. Now this is not an all inclusive sort of guide. All right, uh, there are lots of other things out there, uh, other methods and so on. That's all they work okay. This is these are some things that can be utilized uh, from an organic standpoint for controlling pests in lawns and landscape settings. First of all, what is organic? What does it mean? Well, it means a lot of things, but in the in, in the in the lawn care, uh, landscape maintenance, etc., in that field, it has become uh, common to to see phrases such as "without using toxic pesticides and or harsh synthetic fertilizers." So very often that is uh, that's that's the mindset, that's the concept that folks have of of what organic pest control uh, is going to be, what organic production is going to be. Now, it's not 100 percent accurate, I don't think. Because it says uh, without the use of toxic pesticides. If a pesticide is not toxic to the pest intended to be controlled, it's of no value. All right, a pesticide has got to control something. It has to be toxic to the target pest for it to work. You know, an organic rock, you can use that to mash a bug. It's very toxic to that bug. In that case, okay? uh, now, what I think a more accurate statement would be ones that are maybe a little more specific in the kinds of critters or, or the number of critters. They're not such broad spectrum products. Uh, they're more specific into, as to the terms of the pests that they're going to control. Also, uh, the uh, residual uh, is generally not going to be very long at all. And a majority of these products, uh, these organic materials, are going to be contact materials only. And that means if you don't hit the critter, you didn't control the critter. So you've got the thorough coverage, excellent coverage is essential for a lot of these products to work. Uh, any organic system, I don't care what it is, if there's not some major focus on building soil health, then it's probably not going to be successful. So that's the basis of it. That's where the whole organic movement started years ago. They talk about, uh, you, you'll hear terms of, well, organic is really just the way the grandparents parents used to do things grandparents used to do things because that's what they had available to the use of animal years, plant residue, and so on to build soil health, to improve soil tilt, soil fertility, and so on. So if there's not some emphasis placed on that, it's not going to be a successful immune system regardless of who you're talking vegetable production, large-scale production, lawn care, uh, uh, ornamental plants, etc. All right. Why would anybody choose organic? Well, different reasons, different people. One may have to be with their perception uh, on, uh, regarding the use of pesticides, and that's certainly, uh, that, that's certainly understandable. <clears throat> a pesticide is a poison, okay, in some way. I mean, it's toxic to something. Right, it has to be. It has to be. Uh, perceptions regarding use of fertilizers. Regardless, if, you, if, if, you, if your goal, if your decision is to use organic methods and practice uh, organic production, organic pest control, et cetera, then base that decision on, on research, okay, on your research and your thoughts, not what somebody tells you, not what I tell you, or not what some particular group tells you, but just, just look at the whole body of information out there and make your own decision because there, there are lots of opinions and lots of information, uh, and, and some of those things tend to fall to, to, to either end of the spectrum. And somewhere in the middle is probably uh, you know, a reasonable explanation, a reasonable answer uh, about uh, uh, organic pesticides, synthetic pesticides, etc. Okay, soil building though, let's talk about that because that's going to be the cornerstone of an organic program. And when you talk about soil building, I mean, in essence, what you're trying to do is increase organic matter. All right, well, what does that do? What, I mean, what is organic matter even like? Well, it's, 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 it's dead stuff, it's still used to build out. Plant residue, it can be different animal residues, animal byproducts, uh, animal waste, uh, remnants, uh, byproducts of animal processing, bone meal, blood meal, etc., feather meal, those kinds of things. Uh, the various manures have been composted, have been processed, and so on. I mean, plant residues. Now, it, it promotes 
soil biological activity. Okay. Well, what what are we talking about there? We're talking about critters, things in the ground. We're talking about fungi. We're talking about bacteria. Uh, you're also talking about larger invertebrates, uh, bugs and worms, uh, etc. Sow bugs, peel bugs, things like that. Um, but but really, the, the the big volume is going to be those microscopic things that we can't see, the fungi, the bacteria, and so on. Uh, they play a lot of roles. You do add uh, nutrition, okay, nutrients. All plants have some portion of the nutrients they utilize throughout the course of their life in them, okay? And so there's 19 essential plant nutrients. With the exception of maybe uh, some air and water, all of those are gonna have some, some minute amount of those uh, different minerals, those different uh, nutrients inside them. So there's nutrient recycling. It's your adding some nutrition back into the ground. Now, it would be great if you can say, go your garden or go your lawn and, and add organic matter in your fruit. But it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Why not? I mean, if you, let's say, I mean, what is, what is average organic matter content of uh, Middle Tennessee soil? Anybody have any idea? On a percentage basis, if you're just going to take a stab at it, uh, a relatively high organic matter soil, what would it average in the state of in, in middle years. Anybody have any thoughts? Any ideas? If you were in the two, two and a half percent range, that'd be pretty good. That'd be pretty good. Uh, now, can it be higher than that? Well, it can be. It can be. And, and hopefully through, through the, the soil building process, you would make it higher than that. But why won't it stay there? Well, here's why because you're increasing those populations of those fungi, out of bacteria and such that consume those things. That's what they live on. That's why the addition of organic matter increases soil biological activity because you've provided a food source for those microbes. When the food source, you know, it's carrying capacity. It's like managing any animal. You can only have as many critters there as you have food for them. And so, with the addition, the building of the, the organic matter content in the soil, you can support a lot more of those critters. All right, let them go. They're going to eat the stuff. And, and if they're going to mineralize that and make the nutrition in that, that residue, in that organic matter, available for plants to use. But in the process, they have destroyed it. And so it has to be replanted. So you can't really stop it. Okay, you can certainly make huge improvements, but it's not a one and done deal. You don't get there and say, well, I rest and I'm retired. <laughs> now, Benefit, and, and, and I say compost simply because compost is a stable material. Compost has already gone through a, a degradation process. That's what composting is. It's a biological decomposition, organic waste to a managed process. I mean, basically, <coughs> wrong. It's composting is, is control rot, control decay. Okay, that's because we are controlling it. We are trying to enhance it and maximize the composting process so it doesn't take all year to do it. Okay, so, so the addition of compost is a good thing. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, it does, adding compost is going to apply some essential nutrients to the soil. But that's that, that's secondary in my opinion as far as the benefits are concerned. Uh, this is a real benefit, the fact that it improves soil structure. It creates greater pore space for enhanced root growth. So, so what do plants have to have? Plants, have, in order to survive in the soil, they've got to have, they've got to have water, they've got to have air in the roots to it. Okay, they've got to have a medium to anchor the soil provides those things. So from the from the, the from the standpoint of air and water, where is the air and the water in the soil? Well it's in the spaces between the solid parts. Alright, the solid particles of the soil, they don't fit together perfectly, and so they have pore spaces in between the pieces. Well those pore spaces is where the air and the water are going to reside. If you do, do any of you have soil with a high clay content? There you go. Absolutely. Everybody, if you have any soil, should raise your hand if you live in Rutherford County. Mm -hmm. You do. Now, clay, okay, why, why is it called a clayey soil? Because it has a, a large quantity of the clay, that, that particle in there. Well, the clay particle, if you compare a clay particle to a sand particle, I mean, the, the sand is magnitudes larger. You cannot see that clay part. You cannot see an individual piece of clay. A particle of clay is too small. 
Okay, so you've got these very small particles that make up clay solid. How big are the pore spaces? They're little bitty pore spaces because they've got little bitty pieces. That's why clay ground, when it gets wet, it's wet. Because it gets saturated and it takes a long time to dry it because there's not enough pore space for that water to have for gravity to pull it down. Okay? And when it gets dry, it's dry. Because any water that remains in there can be bounced. There can be water still in that soil, but it's not a label plant because that, those, those particles hold it so tightly in those pore spaces. The plants can utilize it. Boy, organic matter, it's like the thermos bottle of the soil. Thermos bottle, you know, it's You put hot stuff in it, stays hot. You put cold stuff in it, stays cold. You add organic matter to a real tight clay soil, it, it increases pore space. So it improves drainage. All right, it allows that real tight soil to drain better. You add it to a coarse texture sandy soil where it drains too much in water. And boom, you slow it down. You improve water holding capacity. So organic matter is great. Decrease with pore spaces, which improves soil tilt, you know, the ease of working because it's looser. It's looser, it's not as bound tightly together, it's much looser. You improve drainage, you improve water holding capacity. Uh, as I mentioned, you, keep, you, you cause it to not hold water as much as it once did or hold water more than it once did, depending on what the initial texture was, with the coarse texture, with the fine texture. Okay. Additional benefits. <clears throat> Organic matter can aid in nitrogen fixation. You know, there are bacteria. We, we talk about legumes, for example. Legume crop, peas, and, and alfalfa, and clover. Uh, uh, those kinds of plants. Nitrogen fixing plants. That's what a legume is. They take nitrogen from the atmosphere and, 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 and fix it in the soil. And at some point it becomes available not only for their use, but for other plants through the neighborhood. They can use it too. Well, it, it's, a, it's a relationship with some bacteria, rhizobium bacteria that do that. Well, the more organic matter you have in the soil, then the greater population you can have of uh, those bacteria that do that. So you can improve nitrogen fixation by having uh, increased organic matter content. It might reduce soil borne plant diseases because some bacteria that well, are, are parasitic to some of those organisms, because you've got more organic matter there, you can have a larger population of bacteria. So it, it can be a benefit in that case. Uh, help hold nutrients for plant to use, and, and good soil will often contain adequate amounts of nutrients so that you don't have to add additional or, or uh, excessive amounts of additional nutrients. Okay, so that's, those are all things that organic matter can do. So, talk about top dressing just a minute because we're talking about lawn care as well as landscape maintenance here, pest control. In it. Top dressing, you, you're familiar with that. Have you ever top dressed your lawn with organic matter with compost? It's a, it's a real simple process. Real simple process. You, you utilize a core aerator, a core plug aerator, punch lots of holes in the lawn, and in most homeowners, we don't have access to equipment, there are machines that will allow you to do this, but it can be very simply, you take a large pile of compost, spread it out in lots of little bitty piles, and then you rake it. Okay, you rake it. it it's, a, it it's a great family fun. <laughs> <laughs> great exercise. Now, it's also a good way to add some cover to new grass if you ever see it in the fall, if you top trees. Okay, but that's, that's what it is. You, that's a realistic way to add organic matter to an existing turf because otherwise, if you want to incorporate it into the soil, what do you have to do? You have to, you have to plow it. You have to disrupt it. You have to till it in, right? Otherwise, it sits there on the surface. It needs to be mixed in the soil profile. Now, this is a relatively slow process because you're talking about punching at the maximum three inch deep holes in the ground. Or you're not punching them. You're pulling plugs of soil out and you're depositing them on top of it. And so you create these holes in the ground. So you spread the compost out there as best you can, and, and hopefully, uh, I'm sure a, a device like this, this point doesn't work on the screen. A drag mat, I mean, you can make a drag mat, a piece of chain link fence with two or four tight either end of it, and drag it across real slow. The idea being that you can move that compost into those aeration channels. Okay, there are top dressing machines that, that uh, some companies utilize. You may even find one at a real store, but you can use it to, to mechanically spread compost material out on the lawn after you've aerated it. It makes life simpler, okay, and, and, and we're all about that. But it, it can be done with very simple hand tools, but it's a realistic way to add organic matter to the existing turf. It takes a lot, okay? This is a cubic idea. A cubic yard, all right, one, one yard, so that's three by three by three, so that's 27 cubic feet of material. 
if you spread it, and, and, and if you have, if you're like most people, you have what will be referred to as a relatively high cut turf. Okay. If, if you've got decent grass, you're mowing it relatively high. So we're talking probably three inches uh, or, or maybe even a little bit more. Very seldom we're going to have grass cut down into the one inch range. If you do, you probably kill it by doing that. Now, warm season grasses can be mown that short, but most of us don't have long to go out to do that. But, so, the, about the maximum amount that we could spread at one time would be a half inch. And realistically, you know, a half inch deep, realistically working in. Well, a yard that's going to cover 645 square feet. That's not a lot. So, on a thousand square foot basis, it, it would take 1.6, you know, more than one and a half yards to cover a thousand square feet add half inch. So it takes a lot of material to do that. But it is a realistic way to do those kinds of things. Now, during bed construction, if you're going to build a bed, that's the time you can have a management too. Because you've got control, you don't have anything in there. You can excavate soil, you can add amendments to it. In this case, adding uh, uh, compost and wood chips. Uh, but this is the time to do it. You can really have a lot of influence on the, the, the composition of that soil during the construction phase, whether it's a, a vegetable garden, whether it's a, a, an ornamental bed, whatever the case may be, this is the time to do it. All right, so we talked about that, that cornerstone, the soil cover. Any questions about that? Because we're going to shift gears now and get into the pest control aspect. Yes, ma'am. And if you have an area that's covered uh, in a uh, ground cover, pretty solid, Best way to do the compost just to sprinkle it in like that, or should I go through and poke some holes in with a fork? Well, you're, you're talking about a, like a broad leaf or an evergreen ground cover? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, like a vinca. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, but what that's not going to, I don't know how much benefit it would be just to spread it on the, because it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be caught up on the surface of the ground. It, it would be very, very slow to ever get into the soil. But you think about it, the act of growing the ground cover adds organic matter. Because you've got roots that are dying, you've got stems that are dying being replaced, you've got leaves that are dying being replaced, you're adding some organic matter into it. Think about it. When, the, when the United States, before we became the United States, or in a, in, when we were an infant nation, and, and, and the, the productivity of the Great Plains, Okay, that ground was so deep and was so rich and why was it that way? Well, one reason it was deep soil. Okay, and not a lot of rock out there. But it was a lot of nutrition in that soil. Why was that? Because they spent all those years growing grasses, prairie grasses, and they were recycling themselves. Shoots and roots and leaves and stems and so on were being replaced and it was generated. Is that an organic matter that soil all the time? That's why that green had that dark, rich black color to it because of organic matter. Okay. Uh, in essence, when you're doing that on that area right now, we may not live to see the benefits in our lifetime, but maybe somebody else will. Okay. But if you wanted to add organic matter to it, you're going to have probably, uh, it, it's going to be more efficient if you do open the ground up to give right. more organic matter a place to go. Okay. Right. So talking pest control, we're going to talk insects, we're going to talk diseases, and we're going to talk weeds to this Okay. All right, so from an insect control standpoint, first thing I would suggest is try to take advantage of those beneficial critters. Those parasitoids, those things that feed the good insects that feed on bad insects. Good bugs that feed on bad bugs. Uh, basic necessities for beneficial insects. Just like any other insect, any other critter, they need food, water, and shelter. The menu for beneficials changes constantly because the plant uh, uh, landscape changes. Okay, things that are in bloom go out of bloom, new things come out of bloom, it changes a lot. <clears throat> one, thing, one thing though, you, we can't ever stop this, some of the good guys use the same stuff as the bad guys. Well, thank goodness, because if, if they didn't, then there wouldn't be anything for the good guys to eat. Okay. Uh, many beneficials are very small, so they have they have short, little bitty mouth parts. Well, that being the case, it's hard for them. You know, if you look at a, a trumpet vine uh, morning blower, okay, it's got a real long flower, deep flower. Well, it'd be hard for little, little guys to even neck that up because they're too small. They don't, their mouth parts aren't big enough. So you use open flowers. But they, they, they don't have, they have shallow neck trees that are uh, easy for them to get to. All right, so just real open flowers, not the deep, bugle-shaped flowers. That's kind of a plus because a lot of these things are small. 
these are big fish, these fish are gonna be small. And you lack a variety of stuff where you've got blooms. If you could have blooms year round, or that'd be great, but if you have blooms throughout the season, from the beginning of the season all the way to the end of the season, that's even better. So we'll look at a couple of some things that may help you do that. But first of all, let's talk about what some of these beneficial critters are. Okay. And those are examples. Aren't they pretty? And they are, they are kind of pretty. Uh, but lady bee, okay, both the larvae and the adult. So how many of you if you see these guys? Well then you know you thought that's a ladybug. Well, most people if they didn't know, they're not gonna look at that and think that's a ladybug. They're gonna look at that and think that thing is ugly. Okay. <laughs> because I guess, you know, but now to another ladybug, you might be the most beautiful thing you ever saw. But for us it's not a real a real attractive critter. Uh, and, and if you don't think they they bite stuff, pick one up and carry around for a while. You may feel it bites you just a little bit, it's not gonna hurt anything, but they'll do that. But those things are great on these soft bodied insects. They're really good aphid feeders. They will eat a lot of aphids, both the larva will as well as the adult. And you know, how many of you two years ago in the fall, that we've been in uh, uh, October 2013, you were inundated with ladybugs? Why? Why were you inundated with ladybugs? Because there were lots of them. All right? They were looking for a place to overwinter. Why were there so many of them? Because what did we have that year? We had a high moisture year. I think every plant seed that was planted came up and survived. Wow. Okay, so when you have a good growing year, you've got a good aphid year too because those aphids were out there feeding on all the, I mean, the soybean feeds. People that, were, that had homes close to soybean, and it wasn't just them, but those folks that had homes next to soybean fields, there were a lot of aphids in those soybeans. So there was potentially lots of ladybugs out there. Uh, hackberry aphids, the woolly aphids on hackberry trees and such. Folks who lived in the woods, they weren't spared either because there were lots of hackberry aphids and other woolly aphids and such as that. Lots of ladybugs. So those guys, well, those aren't real ladybugs. Those are Asian ladybugs. Yes, they are too. They're, they're real ladybugs. I mean, there's like 5,000 or different species of ladybugs in the world. And the majority of them will eat these, they're, they're, they're good insects from the standpoint of feeding on uh, uh, bad insects. So they're predatory in that respect. So even though they're a real pain, they eat a lot of aphids. Okay, they eat a lot of aphids. Another creature. Uh, so it doesn't matter if you got red ones, pink ones, yellow ones, orange ones, black ones, or brown ones, they all have spots. Now there's some that only have one spot. You ever seen one of those? This has a single spot. I've seen a, a black one that had a single red spot in the center. I only seen one. Same one. It was on the building of Wall over here. I was building one day. I don't know where it came from. But there are some like that. But soft bodied insects, things like aphids, mealy bugs, mites, soft scale. You know, you have soft scale, you have hard scale. They'll feed on soft scale. And they also consume insect eggs. But those are uh, good critters. Lace wing. Now, they have a year of, generally a year, life cycle of year. Now, literature says that there are some cases where adult females have been known to live up to three years. So some of those ladybugs that have winter in your house that year, they may have come back to see you the following year because they remember you. Okay. I don't know. But uh, lace wings, now those don't live near this long, about a six week life cycle. Uh, lots of eggs. And if you've never seen your eggs, right up here at the top, you see that grass blade? It's like little hairs with knots on the end of them. Well, those are lace wing eggs. They're, 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 they're deposited like little leaves down here on, on, on a pedestal, uh, a patio. And, and at some point they'll hatch and they'll crawl out and you know, go do their thing at some point. Uh, green or brown, uh, they've got transparent wings, kind of lacy looking, that's why they call them lacy wings, long body, thin body. And here's a larva of one, it's eating an aphid. They're kind of like the, the uh, they're kind of like the beetles, the lady beetles, they eat soft body insects. Aphids and mites, thrips, uh, mini bugs, uh, they'll eat the eggs of moths, small caterpillars, other soft bodied insects, but again, primarily soft bodied critters, what they're going to feed on. Hoverflies. Now, they, they, these are small, okay, very small. A uh, year or less for the live cycle, they'll lay a lot of eggs. They can be shiny, yellow and black, white and black stripe. And these are good pollinators, too, these little hoverflies and some of them. You know, we can think about honeybees being a primary pollinator, they're probably not the primary pollinators in the world. Native pollinators are little, little flies, little critters, little sweat, you know, sweat bees. The most irritating things in the world, but they're good pollinators. Okay, they'll pollinate some of these small flower things. So, you know, nothing, we don't have a perfect system, all right? So we gotta take the good with the bad. But these little hoverflies, the adults feed on pollen, but their larva, they'll feed on the soft-bodied insects, aphids, uh, and spider mites. 
So those are, they can be good fish. A tekinid fly or a tekinid fly, you'll hear it pronounced out of your way. A lot of different species, so you have various life cycles. But these things are real little, gray, brown, or black, lighter color uh, uh, with lighter or colorful markings. They'll feed on things like caterpillars, sawflies, and a sawfly. Um, a sawfly is a wasp like thing, it's got clear wings. And, and the adults are not such bad guys, but the, it's their larva. You have pine sawfly, rose leaf, anybody have roses? Okay, you ever notice, if you go out and look at them right now, you've got brown place on the leaves, like something's eating the leaves. Rose sawfly, a rose slug, which is a larva of a rose sawfly, is what's doing there. Uh, oak sawflies, pine sawflies, etc. lots of different ones. Birch sawflies, they, they'll defoliate plants in large numbers. They'll just totally eat the foliage off of them. Stink bugs. Okay, a lot of different stink bugs. Green stink bugs, brown stink bugs, you know, these plant bugs, and grasshoppers. Okay, and one thing not listed up here, there's also one of these flies that will kill fire ants. And it works pretty cool because what it does is it's a decapitating fly. And the way they work is they, uh, uh, they lay their eggs on the, on the guys. Okay, you can see the little circle, those are eggs. They lay their eggs and the egg hatches and, and, and the thing goes inside. Okay, it burrows down inside. And it pupates in there, and once it's pupating, it pops out and it pops the, the fine's head off and all of that. So it's a decapitated fly. That's a tough way to go, I guess. I'm trying to think of that too so much. But you know, there's lots of ways in this world to meet your eating. <laughs> uh, so, you, you know, bugs don't have as many eat. Uh, parasitic wasps, and, and, and these things are really small. I mean, you look at this. This probably looks like a cabbage worm with a cabbage looper. And so you got an adult wasp on top of it. So you know how big a cabbage looper is, uh, a cabbage worm. So that gives you some ideas to scale how small that little wasp is. I mean, they're little, you know, they're bigger than gnats, but they're not much bigger than sweat bees. Those are guys flying around there. They're pretty small things. They are, the, the reason they're parasitic is they, they lay their eggs, they insert and lay their eggs inside those other critters. Uh, uh, aphids, cabbage worms, tomato hornworms, uh, and, and you can see, you can see a hornworm sometimes. And if you're not, they're a great big green worm, big fat one, you know, almost big around your thumb, maybe an inch, inch and a half, sometimes two inches long. And that one worm, it can eat a lot of leaves because it's a great big thing. But if you ever see one that's got little like, like white spines up their rain on down their back, that's a dead worm that just doesn't know it yet because that's where one of these guys have laid their eggs in. And if you let it go long enough, you when know, you put it in the jar, you can see the worm died if you want to. I'm not suggesting you ought to do that. But, uh, <laughs> army worms, a lot of worms. These swaps work good against a lot of worms. The insects, corn borers, cabbage loopers, uh, army worms. Why army worms called army worms? Because they appear in huge numbers. And they, they, they can destroy a new lawn, boom, and heart. And, and you can certainly control them with a lot of things, but. Most people don't notice them until it's too late. We've done the damage. But parasitic wasps help with that. Uh, this is an example. Okay, they, they, they do parasitize aphids. You got a big fat aphid down here. Well, that's not a healthy aphid. You know, obesity is never healthy. And in this case, this guy's been uh, parasitized, swelling up to a pop, and he'll take it on the top. But you can, can give thanks to a parasitic wasp for this. Okay. Now, some of these plants that are beneficial to help uh, uh, attract the wasps and the, and the lace wings and these other critters. Uh, small blossoms, wide open, not real tightly constricted, but wide open blossoms can get to them. Things that are in the ash or the carrot buckwheat families can be useful. Early in the season, if you do, when the adult insects show up, before you have lots of, of prey for them, okay, the, the bad insects, they're going to need a source of pollen, a source of nectar. So it's important to have some early Okay, in the growing season to help build those populations beneficial so that uh, when the pest population gets higher, you've got something there ready to work. All right, so here's some examples. Sweet alyssum is a good hardy annual. So early in the spring of the year, it will germinate pretty fast. Uh, it, it, it tolerates drought, it tolerates heat very well. Lots and lots of little bitty blooms. And there's a hoverfly on, the, on those. So you give an idea how small the blooms are. So little hoverflies up there feeding on, on sweet alyssum. That's a good option. How big the plant is it? Um, they grow, mm, yeah, yeah. Uh, bachelor's buds, corn flower, 
Now that's an annual wildflower. The cool thing about these, and you can buy the seed and, and sow those every year, and probably if you get a if, if you get them started, they're going to receive themselves. They're pretty good receivers. But the cool thing about these is they have what's called extra floral nectary. So that means that even though they don't have flowers, they may not have flowers, the, the leaves will uh, uh, produce nectar. So that these guys that need some nectar, they'll have it before the flowers come out. Uh, good for pollinating insects, and it should, such, it shouldn't say such as, but pollinating insects and like lady beetles, lace wings, uh, some of the parasites, well, I don't know the lady beetles, lace wings, but pollinate. But it does attract pollinating insects as well as some of these other good guys. Cosmos, again, that's another annual. It grows well uh, in, the, uh, in the summertime. You get various uh, solid colors in them, and you get them blooming. Uh, they start blooming this month, and as long as they get adequate water, they'll bloom until frost kills them. Bloom all summer long. They're good for pollinating insects, uh, attract hoverflies, uh, pirate bugs. You can see the picture of the pirate bugs, big eyed bugs. Uh, uh, but those are parasitic bugs, we plant bugs and such as that. Lace wings are attracting the cosmos and so on. Coreopsis is a, a perennial. It comes in different colors, kind of like a daisy. Um, mostly solid colors. Uh, got a lot of beneficial insects that will be drawn to the Coreopsis. And the good thing is, you know, when you, you plant them, they'll be coming back here if you're going to talking about a perennial plant in this case. Uh, and they're, they're strong. They're drought tolerant plants, they tolerate heat pretty good. Cat mint, uh, and it's in the Napita uh, family. There are a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of different species though. Uh, cat milk is, it's, it's a different species. And, and these guys, they're a little more ornamental. The cat mint is probably more ornamental than, or 